Welcome, everybody. We're just allowing people time to log in, and we will be starting in just a second. Bienvenue, Elizabeth and Glenn. Tom, whenever you're ready. Excellent. Thanks, Gabrielle. Bonjour, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Tom Cormier, and I'm the president and CEO of Parliamentary Centre. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge that the Parliamentary Centre is in Ottawa, which is on unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. The peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation have lived on this territory for millennia. Their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Welcome back to our ongoing virtual speaker series on issues important to democracy and democracy support uh, supported by the US Embassy. We have a very important discussion today and a very distinguished group of experts on one of the most pressing issues that is eroding confidence in democracies and something that we need to be concerned about. How foreign meddling and disinformation is both influencing and eroding confidence uh, and it's something we need to take action on. Parliamentary Centre board member and CEO of Digital Public Square and my friend Farhan Ladhani will launch today's discussion. Over to you, Farhan. Good afternoon and welcome to the sixth edition of the Parliamentary Centre's Global Democracy Dialogues. My name is Farhan Ladhani. I'm the CEO of Digital Public Square and board member of the Parliamentary Centre. Founded in 1968, the Parliamentary Centre is one of the leading and longest serving non-governmental, non-partisan organizations dedicated to the strengthening of parliamentary democracy in Canada and around the world. Our conversation today is part of a year long virtual speaker series supported by the US Embassy in Ottawa. This series looks at the challenges and threats to democracy in the world today and seeks to ask tough questions about how we collectively improve our strategies and adopt new tools to better respond. Today, we're looking at one of the toughest and most harmful of these challenges, hostile foreign state sponsored disinformation campaigns. As the CEO of Digital Public Square, my team has been at the forefront of trying to understand the effects of this challenge on people around the world and to develop new approaches to reduce its harmful effects. Hostile foreign state sponsored disinformation isn't new. The scale and velocity, however, and consequently its effects on entire populations is. We see it all around us, from conflicts fueled by mis- and disinformation to interference in electoral systems. This is why I'm so grateful to the Parliamentary Center for bringing together an incredible group of people to help us all collectively develop better approaches to tackle this critical issue. Let's start with our two Canadian facilitators. Galit Dobner is director of the Center for International Digital Policy at Global Affairs Canada with responsibility for the G7 rapid response mechanism to counter foreign threats to democracy, as well as broader issues at the intersection of foreign policy and technology. She formerly served as political counselor in The Hague and Algiers. She's also served as deputy director at Global Affairs Canada for various international security files, including counterterrorism, the Middle East and Afghanistan. Prior to this, Galit was a Middle East analyst at Canada's Privy Council office, and she has a master's in political science from McGill University and Sciences PO. Marcus Kolga is the founder and director of DisinfoWatch and a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier and CDA Institutes. He's a journalist, filmmaker, digital communications developer, and human rights activist. Marcus led the Canadian Civil Society campaign for Magnitsky legislation and continues to advocate for global human rights and democracy activists. Marcus is a regular commentator on international affairs and human rights and his articles have been published in the Globe and Mail, Maclean's, New York Daily Mail, and the Atlantic Council, among many other international publications. This is gonna be a great conversation, and I know you're all eager to get started. Let me turn it over to Galit and Marcus now. 
to you. The link. Great, super. Uh, someone will tell me if you can't hear me, I hope. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm super pleased to be here today to be joined by my co-moderator, colleague and fellow Canadian, Marcus Kolga, uh, also by a fabulous panel of experts whom I'll introduce in a moment, and of course by an audience who, who must hold democracy as near and dear as we do to have made time for today's events. Um, special shout out to the Parliamentary Centre, to Tom, uh, Gabrielle, and to your whole team for your leadership in championing these global democracy dialogues. We are living in a day and age of democratic backsliding, and the headcount is dropping year on year. I don't want to be dramatic here, but I personally am pretty worried about the world that my kids are going to live in. We really need to work together to shore up our own democracies and help others to do the same if we're going to preserve our values and our institutions. And one of the threats that democracies face, as we've already heard about this afternoon, uh, both here in Canada and in the United States, is foreign interference, and that includes foreign state-sponsored disinformation. Now, uh, a bit of a note here, Canada hasn't traditionally been a major target of foreign interference, not in the same way that other countries have. But the U.S. elections in, in 2016, where we saw that egregious meddling, followed by similar experiences in Germany and France, and then, of course, who could forget the U.K. referendum, really opened everyone's eyes up to this real and present threat of state-sponsored disinformation. And it's a threat that is compounded by emerging technology. It renders foreign interference cheap, easy, and deniable. So here in Canada, we mounted a pretty comprehensive defense for our 2019 and 2021 elections. We called it our Protecting Democracy Plan. So it had four pillars. The first one was about enhancing citizen preparedness and resilience. So it meant uh, public reporting uh, about what the foreign threat looked like. Uh, it meant launching the Digital Citizen uh, Initiative, which supported non-government organizations and academia to help build literacy. It also meant that we created a panel of senior civil servants, sort of the five most senior in our government, who would essentially uh, be responsible during the caretaker period for reporting to Canadians if they felt that the integrity of the election had in any way been compromised. The second pillar of this was about improving organizational readiness. That's all the boring bureaucratic coordination stuff, but also uh, novelty was engagement with political parties. So briefing them on a regular basis about what we were seeing uh, within the intelligence community. The third pillar was combating foreign interference. So we stood up the security and intelligence threats to elections task force. This drew on all the intelligence and security bodies in government who brought all their mandates to the table and worked together uh, to try to monitor the environment and respond to threats. And finally, the last pillar was about building a healthy information ecosystem. So an example of that is the Canada Declaration on Electoral Integrity Online. This was a voluntary um, declaration that a bunch of major social media platforms signed on to, saying that they would do their best um, to keep their platforms clean in terms of foreign threats uh, to democracy during elections. Another thing the Government of Canada did is we championed the creation of the G7 Rapid Response Mechanism, which we stood up back in 2019. So this is a mechanism that brings together G7 countries and the EU, as well as some others, to respond to the foreign threats that we are seeing to democracy, and that includes disinformation. So Canada and the US have collaborated closely in this forum. We've even been co-authoring joint assessments to um, develop a shared understanding of what the threat looks like and how to counter it. So as the threat of disinformation grows and morphs, which it is doing in this increasingly complex online ecosystem, our success really depends on a whole of society, multi-stakeholder approach. And I think this event is a great example of that. So I am going to cede the floor to Marcus to say just a few quick words uh, about the threat in the Canadian context for those who are not familiar. And then I will introduce the real stars of the show. So over to you, Marcus. Perfect. Thanks, Galit. Uh, and thanks to the uh, Parliamentary Centre for hosting this incredibly important event to Tom and, and Gabriel for, for pulling this all together. Um, you know, with regards to the threat to Canada, I'm still often asked in interviews if foreign interference is a real problem for Canada and if our democracy and society are really being targeted by foreign governments. My answer is, of course, yes, definitely. 
Canada's National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliament and CSIS have both warned of this threat over and over since 2016. Uh, during the past seven years, we've observed that Canadian issues of national interest are being targeted by malign actors associated with the Russian, Chinese and Iranian governments. In addition to this, elected Canadian officials, their staff and political candidates at all levels of government are being targeted by foreign influence operations. And in the worst cases, Canadian civil society groups and activists are being targeted with harassment and intimidation. Over the past 18 months at Disinfo Watch, we've identified thousands of tweets from accounts once belonging to the Russian Internet Research Agency, or as it's commonly known, the St. Petersburg Troll Factory, which targeted Canadian issues, interests, and elected officials. Uh, we discovered this past July that Chinese, Iranian, and Russian state media exploited the residential schools issue in order to amplify existing divisions in Canada. Uh, disinformation and propaganda focusing on the Arctic and NATO in the Canadian context and our allies is continuing to grow as well. Uh, one, of the most um, one of the most successful recent Russian operations targeted Canadian Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland. In early 2017, when Christian Freeland was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs, agents within the Russian embassy in Ottawa who were trying to derail the Sergei Magnitsky human rights legislation campaign and suppress Canadian support for Ukraine actively peddled twisted narratives about the role that her family played in Ukraine during the Second World War. To discredit Ms. Freeland, Kremlin-aligned actors resorted to a clumsy old KGB Cold War tactic of accusing critics of the Kremlin of Russophobia and much worse. Over the past months, we've seen other regimes adopt similar tactics, targeting Canadians and elected officials who are critical of foreign human rights abuses. Some of those appear to have carried over into the last federal election, which is something we're currently analyzing. Of course, the fear and uncertainty that COVID has caused has also been exploited by these same foreign actors to sow further confusion, doubt, and division among Canadians. At Disinfo Watch, we've observed that Canadian vaccine hesitancy and anti-lockdown movements have been supported and amplified by foreign state media like RT and other platforms connected with them. Making matters worse, some of those narratives have been both innocently and sometimes intentionally shared by a few Canadian elected officials. Cognitive warfare, disinformation and malign influence operations represent a persistent and growing threat to Canada's democracy, society and security. I'm looking forward to hearing from our esteemed panel of experts and of course, Galit, who will now introduce them. Great, thank you so much, Marcus. So I think first up, uh, we have Chris Walker, who's Vice President for Studies and Analysis at the National Endowment for Democracy, a private nonprofit dedicated to enhancing democratic institutions worldwide. Chris is an expert on authoritarian regimes. He's been at the forefront uh, of the discussion on authoritarian influence on open systems, including what he terms sharp power. His articles have appeared in all of those newspapers and journals that we read. He's co-editor of the edited volume, Authoritarianism Goes Global, The Challenge to Democracy, and co-editor of the report, Sharp Power, Rising Authoritarian Influence. And Chris was one of the first people I met in this business. He shaped my thinking enormously, and I follow his writing closely. Uh, next up, we'll have Dr. Shelby Grossman, who's a research scholar at the Stanford Internet Observatory, where she's studying ways in which the internet is abused to cause harm. Her articles appear in a host of poli-sci publications, and she has a book with the Economics Choice and Society series at Cambridge University Press. Her research interests are online political disinformation discourse, which should come as no surprise, uh, comparative politics, and a special focus on sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Grossman also worked as an assistant professor of political science at the University of Memphis. Uh, she was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University's Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law. And her PhD comes from Harvard back in 2016. Finally, uh, we will have Christina Wilfor with us. She's a global democracy activist who works with political leaders and international non-government organizations to improve the quality of campaigns and elections and to bring new voices into politics. She specializes in analyzing responses to the threat of disinformation, something that's sorely needed. And with field experience from over 27 countries, she works to build transatlantic networks to address the challenge. She's currently Senior Advisor of Disinformation Strategies at Strategic Victory Fund, an adjunct professor with the George Washington University, uh, producer and host of Fatima's Hand, uh, if you don't know it, a podcast featuring women fighting for gender equality, 
and she serves on USIP Civil Society Working Group, the United States Institute for Peace. Uh, back in 2020, uh, Christina co-founded the Women's Disinformation Defense Project, uh, which is comprised of influential women's political groups. Uh, so that's a rundown on all of our panelists. I will now turn the floor over uh, to Chris. We'll hear from each of our panelists in succession, and then Marcus and I will have a few questions for them before we turn the floor over to the audience. So Chris, can we turn to you now? Yes, and thank you so much, Khalid, for that kind introduction. Thank you also, Marcus, and thank you to the organizers at the Parliamentary Center for inviting me to this, uh, to this great discussion, really appreciate it. But what I would do at the outset is um, widen the aperture a little bit and just talk about the context that we're confronting this very serious uh, disinformation challenge in. And I think it's fair to say that um, foreign malign influence, if you think about it, really needs to be thought of in comprehensive terms. Khalid alluded to this. I think while disinformation is a piece of the challenge, it's not the entire challenge. And it, in and of itself is a major challenge. There's no uh, dispute about that. And how disinformation relates to election interference is also in and of itself a very serious challenge. But I think for, um, for getting this right and for making a dent in the problem that has emerged in earnest over the last five to 10 years, we also have to think about the way in which strategic corruption is used by malign foreign actors that have the reach now and the integration into open societies, uh, including those in North America, but not limited to that. This is something that China and Russia alike and their proxies have done uh, with some effect. It's also true increasingly in the technological domain in ways I think many people didn't appreciate going back a decade or two ago, certainly. And all of this wraps around the disinformation challenge. So for example, in the strategic corruption and kleptocracy context, it's increasingly the case that kleptocratic networks will use disinformation as a way to advance their own needs and causes. Um, again, I think in ways that open societies have not really been prepared for. And this is not a part of the suite of responses that would have normally emerged in the 1990s or the uh, early 2000s from a democracy assistance point of view, but it's squarely in front of us today. I think it's also worth emphasizing that um, the assumptions about the technological revolution are central to this challenge. So for example, um, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter were launched in 2004, 2005, and 2006, respectively. And since that time, in addition to their beneficial effects, it's very fair to say that they have, on the one hand, disrupted traditional journalism, They've also fueled political polarization, and they've provided what was in many ways an unanticipated but deeply potent delivery system for disinformation. And so all of these things are bound together in very complex ways that require uh, complex treatment. And this is true not only in the context of a discussion relating to the United States and Canada, but I think um, most stunningly from the perspective of, say, a decade and a half ago when these platforms that were launched from uh, uh, the United States were um, first coming on the scene and gaining steam is how this would have proliferated to all sorts of other settings around the world. But now with hindsight, given the vulnerabilities of the systems, the inherent insecurity of these platforms, it's no surprise that the challenges we're discussing are now facing people throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, Southeastern Europe, and elsewhere. And I think this is something for us to reckon with. Let me just say a word about why it matters that these large authoritarian powers are now engaged so deeply beyond their borders, including in open societies. I think it's really important to stress that these authoritarian regimes that face few checks on their own behavior at home, they have a point of view. And as they engage beyond their own borders, this point of view is expressed in ways that we need to reckon with in open society. So for example, um, it's fair to say that the leadership in Beijing and Moscow do not privilege and respect freedom of expression and pluralism. On the contrary, they invest enormous resources at home to prevent freedom of expression and to prevent pluralism. I think as they've engaged more deeply beyond their own borders and have more 
leverage in our own systems, they seek where they can and where the circumstances and the settings permit to see their privileges uh, make further headway. And I, I can talk more about this later in the discussion, but I think it's fair to say that in many key democratic institutions and sectors, uh, these authoritarian powers have made um, important and troubling headway in reshaping the rules of the road to fit authoritarian preferences rather than liberal democratic ones. And as I alluded to earlier, it's not just in North America where this, where this is an issue, but increasingly we see evidence and hear reports of how this sort of reshaping the rules of the road, priv privileging um, certain narratives that uh, redound to the preferences of the authoritarians are now becoming more systematic in other parts of the world as well. And finally, I would say, because all of these challenges have become more uh, complex and they've proliferated globally, it really is the case, as Galit alluded to, that we need to devise full spectrum responses to these challenges, which means on the one hand, it can't simply be done by governments on their own. Uh, governments are essential, they're critical. Uh, the democracies have to rally them to address these challenges on the one hand, but they're absolutely not equipped to deal with all of it. And hence, non-governmental organizations and the non-governmental sector writ large needs to play a much more prominent role in a complementary and collaborative way with governments when possible in order to meet the challenges. And what that means in more specific terms is that the sorts of analysts and scholars, practitioners who are working on these issues in their different shapes and sizes need to have more systematic ways to come together, to learn from each other, to adapt to changing circumstances. At the same time, those sorts of experts and, and other um, actors need to come together across regions and countries because it's simply not adequate to have one region talk to itself about these challenges. Because for example, in Eastern Europe, the disinforma disinformation challenge has matured and countries in the Baltic states and in Ukraine in many ways are farther along than many countries in Western Europe or North America or other parts of the world. That's just one example but it really speaks to this need to new creative and innovative pathways for addressing these problems that simply weren't in the toolkit going back 10 or 15 years ago. And then I just finished with this observation, which is if the better resourced um, countries, democracies that have stronger institutions can't start to set a standard on these issues, can't respond in an effective way, it's very hard to imagine how the more poorly resourced countries with weaker institutions, the swing states, will be able to get off the blocks and do this. And in fact, the best way to make this move ahead is to have these kinds of countries work together with each other and learn and help each other in this new environment where no single country can deal with these challenges on its own. And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Chris. So I think I'm um, up next. So I'm just gonna be talking briefly about some current trends that my team has been thinking about lately when it comes to mostly disinformation, but also misinformation. So I'm just gonna make three points. So the first point is that I think a lot of times when we think about disinformation and misinformation, we're thinking about clearly falsifiable content. Um, and sometimes that is the issue, but I think oftentimes we're seeing a lot of content that isn't as black and white. Um, so to give you an example from my research focusing on Russian disinformation targeting people in Libya, often what we see Russian actors doing is what I would call non-falsifiable astroturfing. So astroturfing is when you kind of create these fake persona accounts that are pretending to be like ordinary Libyan citizens just expressing their opinion about a certain issue or a certain politician. Um, and so the statement itself is not true or false. It's just like an opinion, but the deception, the disinformation is coming from the behavioral deception. So that's a lot of what we see in, in disinformation, I think everywhere, but including targeting people in Africa. Um, so for example, you know, creating a fake Libyan persona account who says, I think Saif Gaddafi should be the president of Libya. That's not true, that's not false, it's just the opinion of a fake account. Um, and we see this in the, in the US as well. Um, so I mean, in the US 2020 elections, 
the main disinformation challenge was not from foreign actors. It was from inside the house. It was from domestically created misinformation. But even then, you know, a lot of the misinformation was clearly falsifiable, but a lot of the problematic content wasn't. Um, so for example, there was a, a real thing that happened around the US elections last year where uh, police in some county were pepper spraying Black Lives Matter protesters. And so people on Facebook would share a news article of this real thing that happened, but then they would caption the, the post saying that this was a more general problem and that it was happening in many places when in fact there was only evidence that it had happened in this one place. So, you know, what, if I was Facebook, what would I do about that content? I'm not, I'm not totally sure. So I think there's a lot of like gray zone content where it's not totally obvious how it should be handled. Okay, so that's the first trend. The second trend that we're thinking about um, particularly in, in influence operations targeting people in Africa and the Middle East and uh, Southeast Asia is uh, influence operations that include coordinated harassment. So there'll be both disinformation, but also coordinated harassment of like opposition figures. So two quick examples of this. The first is uh, we've seen um, a, on Facebook coordinated reporting of accounts in Pakistan. So as I'm sure many of you know, if you're like on Facebook or Twitter and you see a post that you think violates the platform's terms of service, you can report it to the platform. And so what we're seeing is adversarial use of that reporting functionality. So Facebook found and suspended a network that was uh, working to identify people on Facebook who posted anti-Islamic content and then coordinate um, in private groups to report those accounts so that they would be taken down. Um, another example, there was some really interesting BBC reporting from last year that showed that in Tanzania, uh, some, some actor, we don't know who, was coordinating to report activist accounts by claiming that these activist accounts had violated uh, copyright infringements. So they would make these reports, reports through Twitter that the account had posted something that was uh, that was copyrighted when it doesn't look like it was um, to try to get Twitter to suspend these accounts. So that's the second theme we're seeing. And then the third theme that we're thinking about is uh, something maybe that people are familiar with, but that's this trend toward increasingly local outsourcing of disinformation operations. So to give you an example of like what this trend has looked like, uh, in 2019, there was evidence that a Russian operation targeting people in Libya had been outsourced to an Egyptian digital marketing firm. So that they had hired this Egyptian digital marketing firm to create content targeting people in Libya. But by 2020, they had they seemed to have abandoned that approach and were outsourcing their operation to Libyans in Libya. So they had uh, Libyans create this, this fake media brand. We don't know if the Libyans knew what was going on, um, but they created this fake media brand. There were actual Libyans who would like identify as being reporters for this media brand that um, had been sponsored by Russian actors. Another example of this kind of sort of outsourcing is uh, there's evidence that uh, in uh, 2020, I think Russian actors secretly invested in 50% of a longstanding Libyan media outlet. So they basically purchased half of this, this reputable Libyan media brand, but they didn't tell anyone. Um, and so our team did some analysis of content of that media brand. And you can see that over time, um, after the, these Russian actors invested in it, it became more pro-Russian. Um, and so there are advantages and disadvantages to this kind of outsourcing. So the, the main advantage is that, you know, if Libyans are creating content for other Libyans, the content is going to be more persuasive, more engaging. But the downside is that uh, there are going to be operational security risks in that, you know, it might make it easier for the operation to be uncovered. So I'll conclude by just talking about one future risk that we're thinking about when it comes to disinformation that would actually solve a lot of these problems for threat actors. And that is the use of uh, large language models. So artificial intelligence tools like GPT-3 is, is one example. So these are large language models that are already capable of creating text that sounds like it was written by people. Um, so you can just tell the language model, hey, write me an article saying that there are microchips and vaccines and these models can write you an op-ed and it looks extremely professional, the grammar is perfect. Um, so at the moment, uh, the really sophisticated large language models are not publicly available, but many people think that at some point these types of models will um, be used by, by threat actors. And I think the real risk for these kinds of models is that 
at the moment, a lot of disinformation researchers find disinformation campaigns by identifying repetition of language. So for example, in one uh, Libyan disinformation campaign that my colleague Fija Ramali uncovered, uh, she uncovered this operation because there was a tweet from an account that was talking about this issue of um, Russian prisoners in Libya. And there was just something about the phrasing of the tweet that struck her as unusual. So she just copied the phrase and put it back into the Twitter search bar. And then from there found many Twitter accounts that had used the exact same phrase. And then from there, that led to like this massive, uh, this very large uh, Facebook operation that she was able to uncover and Facebook kind of simultaneously uncovered it as well. So again, in that example, Hadija was able to uncover this operation because the disinformation actors were lazy and they had just used the same phrase over and over again. But once threat actors have access to these kinds of large language models, they won't need to do that. And it's gonna make it much harder for researchers uh, researchers like my team to uncover these operations. So I will stop there and hand it over, I think, to Christina. Thank you very much, Dr. Grossman. Super appreciated. I think the point um, that you've made about the broader challenge of information manipulation is extremely important. We often use disinformation as a kind of shorthand, but you're right, the phenomenon is broader and, and growing uh, more broad. Um, also fascinating and ominous what you had to say about the large language models. Of course, the next frontier will be the potential ability to then micro-target the audience, which takes it one scarier step forward. Uh, so maybe, Christina, we can turn to you now. Yes, absolutely. So um, great and wonderful framing uh, uh, comments by my colleagues. And thank you for this opportunity to speak on such an important topic. So an area that is flying under the radar a bit when it concerns disinformation and democracy and foreign meddling is really the role of gender disinformation and the organized attacks to undermine women candidates activists, elected leaders for the purpose of undermining democracy. So what's new here? In the international democracy community, we focused for years on violence against women elections. Organizations like NDI and IFAS and NED were really early adapters of identifying this as a major barrier to increasing women's political participation in many parts of the world. And that was synced up with a lot of different types of organizations who have been saying this shouldn't be the cost for women to be in politics. So the phenomenon is not new per se, but what is new is our knowledge of how the tools of disinformation are making this so much easier and expanding the threat surface of countries targeted. What is new is that we have evidence now showing the way that digital platforms and technology in the hands of malign actors enable the weaponization of attacks against women at scale and how attacking gender equality is now their favorite new issue. So while we should absolutely be worried about foreign influence operations, we should also be focused on how those tools are being perfected in the countries that are also meddling in other countries' elections. And so the premise of my argument is that we need to pay attention to this and curtail this before we can truly tackle influence operations abroad. What's also new about this conversation now than if we were having it even a month ago or two weeks ago, is the evidence of harms being perpetrated from documents that are coming from Facebook itself, showing that they have chronically underinvested in non-Western countries, leaving millions of users exposed to disinformation, hate speech, and violent content. So let me give a couple of examples of how authoritarian governments or illiberal democracies use these failures to regulate the industry to their advantage. Uh, in late 2020, we saw the government of Vietnam threatening to shut down Facebook entirely if it did not comply with requests to censor anti-state content. And rather than lose access to the estimated billion dollar market that Facebook would have lost, the company complied. Uh, you may have seen the information by whistleblower Sophie Zhang uh, working as a data scientist in fake engagement and what she exposed, which was, quote, multiple blatant attempts by foreign national governments to abuse their platform at vast scale to mislead their own citizenry and cause international news on multiple occasions. She discovered the president of Honduras, uh, right-wing nationalist who supported the military coup, has 
and also accused of human rights abuses has uh, amassed you know large numbers of fake likes uh, on the content he posted to his followers and similar efforts in Albania, Azerbaijan, Mexico, Argentina, and Italy, and really nothing was done. Um, so this kind of documentation really shows us the global scale of what we are facing and how the business interests of these private companies interfere with our ability to get our hands around it. But let's go back to where I started, um, which was on the gender issue. And a growing number of studies and new research really shows us that all over the world, women in politics and women journalists, particularly those of color, are targets of vicious online attacks and gendered disinformation campaigns, framing them as inherently untrustworthy, unintelligent, too emotional or sexualized, uh, or carried out with malign intent and coordination. Uh, so this is a well-known tactic developed by illiberal actors in many countries, including Russia, Hungary, and Brazil. I want to bring it to the recent German election, where from the beginning of her campaign for chancellor, Anna Baerbach faced a dispor disproportionate array of vicious online attacks from both foreign and domestic actors, very much steeped in sexism. So according to a study by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, 18 of the most shared Facebook posts about Baerbeck contained false information or allusions to conspiracy theories. This was five times more than her male counterparts. And it was pro-Russian accounts that made up one of the two main groups behind these attacks. So it wasn't by accident. It was her agenda as a green candidate that was most in opposition to Russian energy interests. So what do we do? I know we'll talk more about this as we open it for a discussion, just to put out a few initial thoughts. One is that we have to prioritize remedies and be more honest about what solutions are needed when. So in some quarters, there's an overemphasis on tools such as digital literacy that can help slow the spread of misinformation by human means, but are woefully insufficient in curtailing the scale of harms we face and also the wrong communication strategy. It really gets us focused on what's wrong with us as a society rather than the technology that aids different forms of fascism if I can use that word um, so boldly, as technology has aided that throughout time. Secondly, we really need to establish new social media standards and really understand the incentive structure that allows for this type of hateful and extremist content to thrive and move from country to country and devise regulatory mechanisms for social media platforms that establish those better standards for consumers. Um, efforts to encourage technology companies to change products and practices is an enormous undertaking against a very powerful, largely unregulated industry. We have to be patient. Um, we have to understand that there's no silver bullet. There's really three buckets around uh, reform of safety standards, protection of personal data, and limits on market power. And there's incredibly important efforts that are on the, the cusp of moving forward, like the Digital Services Act in the EU. And then lastly, I think through democracy technical assistance, we must engage the public and citizens in the countries impacted in a strategy to bolster those lawmakers and civil society to come together around proper regulation and point to the failure of managing harms perpetuated by their products and not just focus on the human dimensions of our interaction. Uh, you mentioned my work in the 2020 election, and I spent a lot of time uh, trying to help organizations to stop looking for the Russian bot operation. These were civil society groups who really are on the front lines of rebuilding trust. And both media and these organizations were overly focused on this in a way that um, prevented them from looking at the threats at home and the way that Trump and domestic actors were eroding trust in institutions, uh, election administration being one of them. And that's a tactic really taken from authoritarian actors. Um, so we have to be a bit more sophisticated in the way that we think about what are the sources of disinformation, how they're being amplified, and how this really transatlantic conversation should sophisticate as we see taking of different tactics from country to country over election after election. 
Thank you so much for that, uh, Christina, and, and, and all the panelists for your uh, introductory remarks. Um, clearly, you've uh, all demonstrated that this is a uh, this is not just a U.S., Canadian, North American problem, but this is a this is a global problem. Um, uh, you know, as Chris mentioned, the Central and Eastern European countries have been have been looking at this issue and have been facing this issue for for much longer. There's there's a lot to learn from them. You know, Shelby's points that um, the the Russians are operating in Africa as well, and and we've they've moved into the realm of uh, of gender as well. So I I have a bit of a two part question for for all of the panelists. Um, you know, I think that our, our discussion today has been largely, you know, focused and framed in, in the context of meddling in elections. Um, I think that these these foreign actors are clearly operating well outside of elections, and they're taking advantage of various different issues, um, and and targeting our 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 entire democracies and societies. Um, so, what what else? What elements? What what elements of our democracy are 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 at risk? And 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 I think the second part of that question is why are they doing it? Um, why are these these foreign actors using disinformation to undermine our, our democracies, um, our and our societies? What's their what's their ultimate objective? Um, and I guess we'll you know we'll I guess we'll go in the same order and, and maybe start with Chris. So I think it's a really good question, Marcus, because we talk about disinformation. I think the default in many people's minds is to think about a handheld device or sitting at a computer terminal um, where you know most of the information people consume today comes through. But I also think it's fair to say that recent experience tells us that uh, efforts to reshape the um, environment in, in which we try to understand the world around us are occurring in our universities, it's occurring in think tanks, it's occurring in other settings that are uh, critical to the functioning of democratic societies and countries from uh, ranging from China to Russia to um, other countries in Eurasia to countries uh, from the Gulf, all are invested in these areas in ways that I don't think we've um, paid sufficient attention to. And I think what, what really needs to happen, and I think there's a huge opportunity there, this is true in all of these democratic institutions we've been talking about, in some respects, it's really about um, upholding standards that are already there on which we've become soft. So for example, in the university context, uh, we would all agree that academic freedom and the safety of students should be safeguarded. Uh, certainly if a hostile foreign power were to intimidate or otherwise seek to shape discussion on a university in a free society, but I'm not sure that's happening all the time now. And it may be because we've become a little lax, a little complacent. It may be because we haven't been challenged in this way. Uh, yeah, certainly coming out of the Cold War was a little bit different. And so I think that's changing. I think there's a lot of good work that's being done by institutions in Canada and Europe and the US to put these issues out in the public domain. The next step is for leaders in our key democratic institutions to take steps to make sure that we're actually adhering to liberal democratic values. And of course, this is true in the technology sector as well, where uh, there is a lot of work to do to make sure that people in positions of leadership, say in US companies and other key companies are adhering to liberal democratic values as they pursue their commercial interests. Great, thanks for, thanks for that, Chris. Um, Shelby, your thoughts? Yeah, I'll just focus on the, the first question. So I actually think it's countries like Libya that are far more vulnerable to these kinds of disinformation campaigns than, than strong democracies. So, I mean, Libya is a really fragile context and there is a very fragile like peace agreement at the moment. And then you have, you know, a Russian disinformation campaign coming in that's spreading rumors that participants in the peace process are accepting bribes. Like, I think it's that kind of disinformation campaign that could be really, really dangerous. Um, and I think it's, it's those types of countries that are actually at most uh, risk of these kinds of campaigns. So I, I would just follow up with that. I mean, we've seen all, the Russians acting in, in Madagascar and, and other countries as well, um, in CAR, 
why are they doing it? Why are they suddenly operating in, in Africa? What's, what's Russia's interest there? Yeah, I think it really varies. I mean, so sometimes the objective is just to uh, try to make it seem like there's grassroots support for a certain politician that Russians think will be aligned with them if that person, you know, wins elections. So um, I think that is what's happened in some contexts like Mozambique, for example. Um, and then I think other times uh, it's to just sow chaos. So I think that's in part what's happening in Libya. That was at least what their objective probably was in the US in 2016 when um, like the Internet Research Agency was both trying to polarize liberals and conservatives to go to like the most extreme sides of their own camp. Um, so I think the objectives really vary. Great, thanks Shelby. Um, Christina, your thoughts? Just from a basic psychological uh, vantage point, you know, disinformation that ultimately makes citizens of, you know, any country where it's thriving more distrustful, angry, or depressed are easier to control. Um, if they don't have faith in institutions, um, they are easier to then, um, you know, continue to erode uh, ways in which those institutions might protect otherwise a free and fair election or or provisions for human rights and it makes it more possible for other foreign agendas then to to uh, interfere when it comes to gender disinformation what we're seeing is that the women who are more likely to be targeted are those who are leading on agendas around climate change uh, migration and immigration or speaking out on feminist issues. And so the objective there is not just um, because there's a handful of sexist men, you know, making sexist comments, but it's to then attack those women to undermine their ability to lead by policy on those issues. And so back to the bareback example, which was why in fact you saw Russian amplification of disinformation using homegrown sexism to make that more you know possible as well as what we've seen in Canada with your former uh, environmental minister um, Miss McKenna who was targeted with a very vicious campaign calling her climate Barbie which may seem like a joke but a joke met with death threats and security force and um, a very dangerous way in which to, to attack her and undermine progress on those issues. No, and, and I take your point as well that, um, you know, I think when we look at these uh, foreign disinformation campaigns, not, not all of it, not all that we're seeing is coming directly from Moscow or Beijing or Tehran. They sow the seeds of these, uh, the, the division that we're seeing, and then they, they seem to be pushing it further and amplifying it uh, once it's started and once it gets going uh, on a local level, right? Yeah. Okay, so I will pass it on to, uh, to Galit, who will ask the next round of questions. Great, thanks for that, Marcus. Um, I'd really like to drill down on one of the issues that some of our panelists have already touched on in their opening remarks. And um, that's the evolution of the foreign actor challenge, um, how exactly it is, it's morphing, how it's evolving over time. Uh, so Shelby has already touched on some of the trends that her and her team have been seeing in the online information space. Um, but I'm hoping uh, that and maybe Shelby has, has other examples and I'm hoping the other panelists uh, can also contribute to the discussion. Uh, obviously the tactics uh, are changing the trend lines are moving and uh, you know we can't really mount a defense looking in the rearview mirror we've really got to be looking ahead uh, and especially since we're talking about how um, digital technology is then leveraged which is is, is changing rapidly what what should we be expecting uh, from aligned foreign actors in the next sort of one to three years what should we be thinking about in terms of primary threats so we can we can prepare ourselves to tackle these challenges and meet them head on So maybe I'll just say a word that builds on something that Shelby alluded to. I think to the extent um, some of these well-resourced malign actors can unlock some of the potential related to AI uh, to bring things to even more scale in the way that um, large language models can, that will certainly be something to be mindful of. Uh, the PRC is um, piloting a lot of these kinds of things at the domestic level, both 
in the context, uh, context of Xinjiang and Tibet, but increasingly looking to apply these across other parts of the PRC. And uh, I think it's understood that if they can apply these learnings uh, elsewhere where their tech foothold is significant, uh, they will, both as a way of uh, hoovering up more data for uh, their own purposes, but um, also just to gain a strategic advantage. So in that regard, I think we can't suffer from a failure of imagination. I also think it's important to recognize that much of the discussion that was going on, even as recently as six or seven years ago, was very much focused on Russia. And for, for evident reasons and rightful reasons, but in the disinformation and information context, very little of that was centered on China, which has evidently more capacity to build it out. And I think what we've seen in the recent past is that the Chinese authorities have taken a decision within the context of Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, and elsewhere, um, and increasingly farther afield, to do things that weren't anticipated in the analyst com uh, community going back six or seven years ago. You'd hear people say, oh, Russia does that. They do the sowing of discord and so forth and so on. But China would never do that. They would just look to tell a positive story about their own government. And uh, that may have been true at the time, but it doesn't mean it's going to always be true, especially when uh, capacity can enable intent. And so I think in this regard, uh, we're seeing a change. And I think we have to you know, alter our own mindsets to realize that uh, for regimes that have no meaningful checks on their own power and who increasingly rely on technology as a bulwark of regime security, these things, of course, will be possible. It's just a question of uh, the opportunities to apply them. Thanks, Chris. And if I can uh, just follow up uh, with a quick cue, do you think that uh, the COVID pandemic was a bit of a turning point uh, for the PRC in terms of its uh, communications approach? And um, also related to that, if we're going to take an actor approach uh, to the analysis uh, beyond China and Russia, what are the other capable actors out there who we need to look out for in terms of um, foreign meddling, as we've termed it in the context of this event? So I think the, um, you know, the largest authoritarian states are in a way in a class of their own. I think what's, what's troubling is that um, much of the learning that's going on, for example, in smaller authoritarian states, doesn't mean that country X is going to adopt the China model. This is often a formulation you hear, can Azerbaijan adopt the China model? I think it's a poor formulation. I think the question is, to what extent can already uh, repressive authorities find ways to leverage learning that will enhance their ability to remain repressive or enhance their ability to retain the sort of control they have? And uh, that I think is very worrisome, both in terms of other authoritarian countries who are not at the level of um, the Chinas, the Russias, the Saudis and so forth, the Iranians, um, but nevertheless are looking for opportunities to become more adept in using technology to advance their repression. And similarly, if we move a little farther on the spectrum of countries uh, in terms of political uh, institutions, as we discussed earlier, the swing states that are now choosing how to approach these issues in many parts of the world may choose in ways that are less consistent with liberal democratic standards because they're learning or having uh, affordances that enable them to um, take steps using technology or making decisions on information management that are inconsistent with liberal democratic values. And I think there are sadly a growing number of such cases out there in any number of settings. Thanks so much for that, Chris. Uh, Christina, uh, Shelby, did you wanna pitch in on, uh, on these questions? Just a couple of thoughts. I mean, the, the reality is that we are in a global theater of threat and operation. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me to see that, you know, bad actors doing bad things, right? That, that, that's not surprising. What's surprising, though, and troubling in terms of this next period is how much is that enabled or aided by the role of U.S. private companies? 
And so I think it requires a much deeper set of actions, um, both in the US and in countries that are able then to curtail some of this and re-incentivize. I think we are just now uncovering, in fact, how much the technology is tied in with the actions, especially around elections. I will also say, and this is what really worries me, is this sort of blurring globally uh, and emerging work of bad actors connecting with each other. Uh, to have a media figure um, like Tucker Carlson rubbing elbows with uh, Orban in Hungary and for CPAC to be holding their conference in Hungary, which is a model for attacking media, attacking and eroding human rights and, um, and using you know, a orthodoxy and a white nationalism to aid that. Um, so, you know, this, this blurring of sort of the lines of who is the bad actor uh, and what are they doing to undermine democracy, I think shifts in this coming period in a way that we may never have expected. And we also saw that in Germany in the way that transatlantic lies are able to move from country to country and attacks on the election system and questioning in Western countries whether elections can be trusted or not is finding an audience in those countries. That I think is one of our biggest challenges. That, that is an excellent point and playbooks are certainly uh, circulating. Um, Shelby, did you wanna add to this? Yeah, so I'll just highlight one thing that I think people often say is something we should be like super worried about in the future that I actually don't think is as much of a problem as people say it is. So people are always like, oh, you know, bad actors are moving to Telegram and Telegram is encrypted. So we're not gonna be able to, you know, track what they're saying. So first of all, you know, Telegram is actually for the most part not encrypted. Um, so most of the kind of channels and groups are, are public and are easily publicly searchable. Um, but second of all, I think in many countries, if these threat actors want to have reach, they just have to be on Facebook because Facebook is like where the pop feel is the platform that the population is using. Um, so this is definitely the case for, for Libya. And so I actually think it's, you know, really encouraging that, you know, of course, Facebook could be doing more, all the platforms could be doing more, but Facebook at the moment is definitely doing the most to try to, um, to find and suspend and publicize these operations. So when Facebook suspends, again, you know, Libya is the country I've been focusing on, when Facebook suspends some of these networks targeting Libya, oftentimes the network will have also had a Telegram channel because they're kind of afraid that they're going to get suspended at some point. And so they want to make sure they have this Telegram channel just as like backup. So the network will get suspended and I'll continue to track the Telegram channel and the Telegram channel will peak at like 300 followers while the Facebook page had like 300,000 followers. And then it will just stop posting after a few months. So um, I don't know, I'm somewhat kind of less worried about these like emerging technologies, at least in the countries I study, at least for, for Telegram than some people are. That's interesting because my team has given a lot of thought to alternative uh, platforms, especially in the wake of the exodus. We saw post Capitol Hill riots from Twitter and Facebook to these, these smaller platforms. And of course, you know, what happens on one platform doesn't stay on one platform. It's all hopscotching from platform to platform, be it alternative to mainstream and back again. And then, you know, with the goal being uh, mainstream media that has the greatest reach. So um, it's interesting to hear, to hear your perspective. Um, I shall not hog the show. Marcus, I'll turn to you. I know you've got a few other questions well we i think we touched a little bit on um on how we we might want to address the problem um you know facebook is is taking some measures i think other social media companies are also looking at it i think a lot of social media companies have a lot more work to do in addressing this issue um and so you know i i guess that as a as a question uh, how are we going to respond we see that the uh, the Baltic states, uh, countries like Finland and Sweden, uh, Taiwan as well, they've uh, implemented uh, measures, um, you know, early childhood uh, literacy programs. Uh, Sweden has a, has a unit, uh, government unit for psychological defense. Um, what do we do? What can we do uh, to defend ourselves against it? And I think, you know, one of the questions that I often ask is how do we deter this, these sorts of attacks when we see foreign interference, when we see foreign intimidation? How do we... Is there a cost that we can impose to this? Because right now, I think a lot of these actors are are, are working, acting uh, with with relative impunity. Um, hoping to get your thoughts on this, Chris. 
I think it's fair to say that it's uh, it's a significant enough problem in scope that it requires um, a multi-dimensional response. So, for example, um, deterrence would have to be a part of it, but I'm not sure that would be sufficient. I think uh, you know if we if we think about the strategic corruption challenge, part of that is, which is another serious challenge in our societies, is tightening up uh, foreign agent registration related uh, regulations, which also went soft, certainly in the US over the years. Um, it requires, I think, also um, new forms of non-governmental engagement that are better equipped to deal with these issues. So for example, the, um, the strategic corruption problem, just to stick with this example, is not garden variety corruption. It's not you know, dealing with uh, the traffic cop in a country X or Y who's stopping someone uh, without good reason, that sort of thing. This is typically understood to be corruption that has the backing of another power that's seeking to advance its policy interests and hence has a much larger strategic component. My suspicion is that in most of our societies, uh, there's a gross underappreciation of the implications of this. So relatedly, if we move into the, you know, the information do domain uh, understood broadly, uh, that's also a big distinction if we separate out what have now become these intertwined problems of domestic disinformation, sometimes operating on their own, sometimes operating with a more direct link to external actors, sometimes just operating on the basis of some sort of loose cover or some sort of seeding of the terrain. From It's become incredibly, incredibly difficult to deal with. But at the same time, I think we could all agree that at least at the outset, um, these sorts of external intrusions should absolutely be unacceptable. And we need to tighten up the standards, both in terms of the regulations that would um, limit the vulnerabilities of the platforms that are now the principal information delivery systems for our societies on the one hand, but I think also to um, go beyond um, you know, simple media lit literacy ideas to more ideas of how to transmit these concepts to our societies about what um, healthy integrity-based information looks like in the modern era. Newspapers are not coming back in the way they existed a generation ago. Um, what does it look like to have a healthy information environment? I don't think that vision is there yet. And in the absence of such a vision, it's hard to see how we fulfill it. And so there too, I think there's a need for some more creative thinking in the non-governmental sector in our societies to help bring these things to life. Well, thanks, Chris. And I don't think it's helpful that uh, companies like YouTube are prov providing um, these massive platforms for state media actors like uh, RT in, in Russia, Belta in, in Belarus, and, and CGTN in, in China. Um, Christina, Shelby, um, thoughts? I would echo much of what was uh, said there. I think we have to sort of put our mind into two different ways of looking at this. What are the root causes that are longer term, that are complex and take a certain level of sophistication? And I believe strongly that those should be grounded in the digital regulation in order to change the incentive structure over these powerful companies that we have no ability to really change their behavior without that. So that's sort of, I think, a fundamental root cause that we need all of our, um, our hands on deck in order to, to get there. The, the second is more immediate, you know, which is how do we manage the problem, make it less bad in the meantime while we're waiting for those, those root cause reforms. And that can take a variety of um, forms. Uh, having uh, civil society organizations who have trusted relationships who can best interrupt the narratives that are being targeted, whether it's distrusting institutions, the election system, um, believing that women aren't as qualified as men to run for office, you know, all sorts of narratives that, that get uh, put out into the world. How do we give them the digital properties, the resources to really build out their operations as well as the know-how to then try to redirect you know, what makes that disinformation effective, as Shelby talked about, the goal being to mainstream. 
uh, these ideas, nefarious ideas as they often are, into the public discourse. Um, so I think those are two, you know, realistic things that we have to organize our energy toward doing better. Yeah, I'll just add two things. So first, Chris was talking about um, about the Foreign Agent Registration Act. So you know, one thing that happened about a year ago was Facebook suspended a network of accounts that were run by an American public relations firm that was working on behalf of the Bolivian government. And so this PR firm had created these fake accounts targeting people in Bolivia, pretending to be Bolivian citizens. Um, and so the network was suspended because it violated Facebook's terms of service. But as far as I know, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't believe the PR firm violated any laws by doing this because they had properly registered themselves with the with FARA, with the DOJ. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what regulation on that would look like, but there's something about that that seems intuitively wrong that we might want to regulate. Um, and then second, I think when we're talking about regulation, we should always be talking about uh, data sharing with academics. So uh, Nate Persilli, who's a law professor at Stanford, has some proposed legislation that I'll put in the chat in a minute called the Platform Transparency and Accountability Act that would require certain like big, basically online platforms to share certain types of data with like certain researchers. And he kind of defines, he takes a first stab at like defining what that would look like. Um, and I think that's uh, kind of a really important proposal as well. Brilliant. Thanks to all of our panelists uh, for their opening remarks and questions. And we will now move on to the public Q&A, which will be run by uh, Gabriel. Back over to you. All right. Thank you all. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Um, really a, a wonderful, a wonderful panel. Um, to our guests uh, on the other side of the, the Zoom space, uh, we will be taking some questions uh, from, from our participants right now. So if you'd like to ask our panelists, um, either American or Canadian, all of us, uh, any questions, please add them to the Q&A function. Uh, we ask that you would kindly identify yourself if you're going to ask a question, uh, and we'll take as many as possible. Um, likewise, if you um, uh, see a question that you would like to see answer, you're able to hit the little like button next to it and um, have that kind of uh, climb up the charts. So uh, we have uh, received a, a couple of questions already. Um, we're going to take a question from Marcin Walecki. Hi, Marcin. Good to see you here. Uh, it was a question addressed to Chris. Uh, Marcin asks, what do you think about the idea of creating a NATO center of excellence for democratic resilience dedicated to providing support to individual NATO allies for strengthening resilience to resist interference from hostile external actors and the functioning of their democratic institutions and processes? Um, he notes that in 2020, the independent group of experts on NATO 2030 supported the notion and their recommendations to the NATO Secretary General. Uh, I, later that spring, NATO Assembly established a working group to refine the proposed concept for the center, uh, and the center could be tasked with facilitating democracy and governance assistance to member states when requested. Um, I know Chris uh, had some comments on this. Um, I'd ask uh, Chris if you could please share those with, uh, with the that. audience here. So, Thank you. So I, as I, um, I'd indicate, I don't have a position on the creation of that as such. But I do think that the um, environment has changed sufficiently and the lack of an ability to um, enable coordination and learning among and between uh, democracies suggests that this sort of thing could be a very uh, useful approach. Uh, if for no other reason that there aren't such mechanisms to enable democracies at different, different levels of development to um, routinely and regularly communicate and share information and learn from each other on these democratic resilience issues. And so I think it's worth considering uh, developing some sort of mechanism along such lines. Thanks so much. Would anyone else like to respond to that question? Sure, if, if you don't mind. Um, we we do have the uh, center of excellence uh, for uh, for disinformation, the, the Stratcom in, in Riga that that exists, and um, I mean it would be wonderful if uh, if NATO partners, you know, I'm looking at Canada specifically, um, could interact more closely there and and work together and share their their uh, their successes in defending against disinformation, and, you know, so that that institution does exist, um, you know, adding to it uh, with a with a COE for democratic resilience is you know is is a positive thing uh, as far as I'm concerned. 
Any other takers on that one? All right. Uh, we'll turn to then a question from Andrew Green. Um, uh, given that authoritarian tactics are nothing new and that there is considerable authoritarian learning happening cross-nationally, how do we address the domestic foreign nexus in disinformation? Uh, Chris has responded a bit in the chat there, but I'd like to open this question to our other guests. Um, what are your thoughts about this domestic foreign nexus in disinformation? Shelby. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this answers the question, but like one thing I'm just constantly struck by when, so my team has like a relationship, like we don't accept money from the platforms, but when Facebook or Twitter suspend a network for coordinated disinformation that's linked to a political actor, they will give us like an advance um, access to the network and we'll like write up a report on it. And we've done dozens of these now. And one of the things I've just constantly struck by is like the similarity in tactics across countries. And I don't necessarily know if it's learning or if it's just like different actors just independently coming up with like the same tactics. So, you know, a common thing I'm sure everyone here has heard of is like for a threat actor to create a Facebook page that's pretending to be an independent news outlet. So I don't know, like maybe there's some domestic operation in the Philippines and they create a page called Philippines News 24 seven or something like that. You just see that constantly. Um, and yeah, I don't know, as a comparative political scientist, I just find that stuff really fascinating. Um, and then I guess in terms of like the domestic foreign nexus, I think it's interesting how, I think someone earlier was using, using language about, you know, foreign actors seeding narratives that then get amplified domestically. I'll just also note that it goes the other way as well, where foreign actors will just amplify um, narratives that are already taking place in the US. So for example, we saw this in the US in 2016, where there were people at the time who thought Texas should secede from the union. And so what did the internet research agency do? They created a Facebook page saying Texas should secede from the union. Um, they weren't the people who came up with that, like Americans came up with that idea. Um, and they would oftentimes just repost content that Americans had already come up with. So it goes like that way as well, where the foreign actor is just amplifying um, stuff that's already happening domestically. Thanks, Shelley. Would anyone else like to, to pick up on that one? Got my hand raised in a very Canadian manner here. <laughs> I guess I can put it down. Um, yeah, I'd like to pitch in on that. I think um, this sort of uh, graying of the space between foreign and domestic has been a central challenge. Uh, I know it is certainly for governments, for my own team. Um, the degree to which uh, we monitor, um, identify, respond to foreign state-sponsored disinformation is very different than how we would treat uh, domestic disinformation. We have a very rigorous code, uh, an ethical and methodological framework uh, that we, we follow. The government of Canada does not track Canadians in the social media space. Uh, that is not at all the goal. And I think along the lines of what a lot of panels have said today uh, about authoritarian governments learning and evolving uh, their trade, I think part of this is a purposeful graying of the spaces. I think they found a very comfortable uh, sweet spot here, and they know it's difficult for governments to respond. Um, and it's also, uh, this, is, this is something that Shelby pointed to earlier, it can also be really effective, right? In order, if you take a domestic narrative that already has some roots um, in, a, in a certain cultural context, and then you amplify it, you know you already have an audience uh, to speak to and that you may have greater effect. So I think uh, this is a challenge. It's not one that we faced a few years ago. It's an, it's an increasing challenge. And I think Shelby was, was right to identify it as one of the trends that her team is looking at and worrying about. And, and it certainly makes our, 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 our jobs harder to wrap our heads around the challenge. I'll just add on that. You know, it's interesting um, <laughs> with the global network of women that we are working with that she persisted. Um, to identify the patterns of how these uh, operations are being organized um, in some ways is satisfying for the individual candidate uh, who is under attack to know that this is um, something that is not necessarily naturally happening within the electorate in their country. In some cases it is, there's still online um, gender-based violence that's organized, of course. But I think that global conversation that gives us a sense of what the patterns are, how the tools are being used, 
um, helps individuals see themselves in context that then empowers them to be more effective in how they deal with it in their community, as well as being part of a global community to then understand how these things are perpetuated. So there's real power in that dialogue and information sharing. If we had more data access, as Shelby mentioned, we would be able to see those patterns much better. So one fundamental, I think, starting point is to in fact force um, through punitive or whatever measures possible to for academics to have more access in order to understand the nature of what's going on so that we can be more precise in our interventions. Thanks, Christina. Marcus, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just had a, a quick example of how um, a foreign government sort of uh, latched into a, a domestic issue and amplified it. In the, in the wake of the 2019 Canadian federal election, there was a, uh, a very small fringe uh, movement that called itself Wexit. This was a, an a Alberta independence movement. They threatened to cede from Canada. Um, you know, it was really just a handful of, of rather angry people who were, were making a lot of noise. Um, Russian state media Sputnik, um, I think it was a week or two later after that election, actually picked up on this story. And, um, and interviewed its leaders. And by interviewing them in this you know, state media, um, legitimized this movement. And that story in Sputnik then was in turn picked up by these Wexit groups that, uh, that had popped up and, and was shared widely. And, and I'm, not, I'm not going to suggest that it necessarily helped, um, was, was uh, you know, uh, critical to growing that movement, but it, this is the way that these, these stories, certainly when they run on foreign state media, they legitimize these marginal movements. And certainly throughout the, uh, the COVID pandemic, we've seen uh, uh, you know, similar, similar uh, tactics being used. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a well-known website called globalresearch.ca here in, in Canada. It's operated in Montreal. It was identified by the US State Department as being a, a pillar of Russian disinformation. Um, and they launder this sort of information in the, very much the same way, uh, COVID conspiracy theories, uh, anti-vax, uh, anti-mask narratives that are then later posted on, on social media and Facebook uh, groups that are, that are against the lockdown and anti-vax. So that's, that's where we're sort of seeing a bit of this nexus in, here, in, here in Canada. All right, thanks so much. Um, we've got a question in the chat from um, Shelly Guy-Baja, I think, a PhD at the University of Toronto and a postdoc at Waterloo. Uh, Shelly's actually asked three questions. I'm just gonna take one for right now. Um, we'll probably come back to, to a second of hers at the end. Uh, but she asks, uh, what role do you see, if any, for private chat apps in the spread of disinformation by foreign actors, especially given that there's some evidence that disinformation is more readily consumed by individuals who may be known to potential targets? So um, talking about these, these private chat apps, would any of you like to pick up on, on Shelley's question? I just, I think it's really hard. Um, it's just, it's not really clear, you know. That, yeah, I mean, so there are some interventions. So like, you know, WhatsApp had this policy change where they limited the number of um, people who could be forwarded a message. I think there are little interventions like that that can be done, but in general, and there, you know, there've been civil society efforts to, I think in India to have like reporting WhatsApp lines. So where you can forward a message to this reporting chat and it will fact check the message for you. So I think there are things like that that can be done, but in general, um, it's really, it's really hard. Thanks. Any other takers? All right. Um, I'd like to, oh, Christina. Yeah, I was gonna say this is as, as negative as you can see as I am on media literacy <laughs> applied, you know, where in, in place of actual, you know, meaningful uh, efforts to tackle this when it comes to countries where we don't have the levers of influence within a parliament or within regulation, then back on that human behavior side is especially around messaging apps, you know, one option um, uh, to just slow the actual distribution by um, trying to incentivize, you know, a different kind of information environment that people see themselves as part of. Um, but it's very dangerous. And especially as we saw in Spanish language in the US um, and the way that WhatsApp played a key role 
on narratives around um, Joe Biden as a socialist and, you know, the elections um, being rigged and all of the things that were a big part of those, those, those types of efforts. I would just add, just to admire the problem a little bit further, um, is, of course, we're talking a lot about um, American uh, tech company apps. And, uh, you know, we have WeChat out there, which I think is the third most popular in the world. Um, and so uh, even as we try to approach the question of regulation for American um, tech giants, I think uh, an increasing challenge is the one coming uh, from other states, particularly authoritarian states, where we have little to no influence. Right on. Uh, sticking with this theme of, uh, of responses and reflecting what Christina mentioned about uh, media literacy, we do have a question on media literacy from Anna Vergara. Uh, Anna asks, do you know or could you list some media literacy initiatives that have good results amongst the general public? Um, this needs to be addressed more broadly, not just within government. Thank you, Anna. Are there some good examples that we can look to? Uh, I would point to the learn dis to discern model that IREX has uh, developed. And I think uh, initially maybe it was Ukraine um, and some of the efforts that they were targeting among younger populations. Um, you know, the challenge for any taking media literacy to scale is that in larger countries, we just don't have the ability to influence curriculums to really get at. Um, a unified approach, but some of these private nonprofit efforts to do that type of training um, are noted as a model. So I'll, that's one I would point to. I would say in addition to that, um, as I understand it, efforts made in Finland to address the challenge have also been quite good. And that's been a comprehensive um, approach, both at the um, uh, primary school level, but also societally taking steps there. It's a smaller country, but nevertheless, uh, aspects of what they've done might be adopted by others. It was chronicled, among other places, in a report that um, Edward Lucas did for us uh, called something like uh, Democracy's Soft Underbelly. He alluded to this. So. I'll maybe, I don't know anything about the research in this field, but I'll maybe talk about something that's worked for me personally. Um, so someone once said, uh, you know, when you see content online, you should think about how it makes you feel and whether there's someone who has a vested interest in making you feel that way. So anytime I see something online, if it makes me outraged, um, I take a step back and I think, is there someone who is trying to make me feel outraged and why? And so to give you just like one example of something that happened uh, just a few weeks ago. So, you know, I'm a political scientist. I'm on like political science Twitter. So there was this very senior political scientist who tweeted something to the effect of like political scientists don't study developing countries, which is like, of course, not true. But all of my like political science friends, you know, just got like outraged and they started like tweeting at him and sending them like links to their work on South Africa or whatever. Um, and, you know, I just think everyone, you know, it doesn't matter like what your education level is, people could benefit from just kind of being thoughtful about you know, whether someone is, is trying to troll you um, and just kind of taking a step back to think, is there someone who's trying to make me feel a certain way? Fantastic, thanks. Marcus. Uh, I would say again, in the Canadian context, there's a wonderful organization based in Toronto called Journalists for Human Rights. Um, they've been engaging in, uh, in training reporters uh, over the past, and journalists uh, over the past two years. Um, now, I don't, there's no way of, measuring its effectiveness, but it's it's a good start. And um, and uh, and all of the journalists who have been involved with those trainings have, have responded positively. Um, you know, and I'd go back to the to the the question of Finland, the Finnish model. Um, there is this uh, media literacy has been injected into that um, school curriculum. And so Finnish children already from an early age start learning about cybersecurity and and uh, digital media literacy. And so this is something I think that we should be, uh, we should definitely be looking at. Fantastic. Gabrielle, let me just add one more point. I would be remiss though, if I didn't add to that, you know, there's limitations of this application, especially the gender blind nature of a lot of the targeting and harassment of women. Um, it's not uh, necessarily a matter of teaching people not to click or other things when it comes to the way that this kind of content 
is seated in society, undermining the qualifications of women and their ability to stand. So I think that's one of the, the limitations that we just have to keep in mind as this, as a remedy. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we're getting so close to the end of our time. I was hoping to have time for two questions. I think uh, instead we're gonna just give ourselves some breathing room to, to give a solid answer to our, our closing go-round question. Uh, and Colin Robertson, thank you for joining us today, has uh, set us up beautifully for that question, which I always like to ask our panelists before we close out. Uh, Colin writes, uh, the late George Schultz used to tell me that democracy was not a spectator sport, uh, but it seems to me that it's no longer a sport at all and that democracies need to take the offense on democracy promotion first at home and then with fellow democracies abroad. Um, what are your recommendations for taking the offense? Where do we start? Um, what can we tell those policymakers, those researchers, those activists, those practitioners in the room today uh, on where we can tackle this most effectively? Uh, if you'll allow me, I'll either take volunteers to go first or I'll go in a circle uh, according to who I see on my screen. Uh, any volunteers? <laughs> Where do we go from here? Thank you. Chris. I'm happy to jump in if that's all right. So I, I would just say in response to the, the question and its spirit, I think it's fair to say that of the concurrent challenges that have emerged, um, one of them are the challenges that have emerged in what have been seen as established democracies. And so on the one hand, uh, it's clear that there needs to be a refreshing of democratic institutions and bolstering in so many places where uh, there's been an erosion. But I think our discussion today reinforces to me that it really is impossible for democracies to treat the external challenges and the internal problems as something distinct that can be dealt with, uh, you know, on some different time plane. I mean, there's no pause button that the malign actors are going to hit uh, with their engagements with uh, our societies. On the contrary, it's inexpensive. It's working for them. If anything, uh, it's going to build momentum. And so I think what we need to do is refresh our own institutions, but not ignore the world around us as we do it and find ways to engage in reform that both refreshes and fortifies our crucial democratic institutions that has the simultaneous effect of safeguarding against these external intrusions, whether we're talking about the information domain, the tech domain, the strategic corruption money domain, I mean, all of these things will be less apt to impact us if our own institutions are stronger. But I really think they have to happen simultaneously and I think our um, political leaders and our policymakers and our civil society institution leaders have to prioritize these things in ways that simply haven't been done in the last 10 to 20 years, because now it's become central to our own uh, security and well-being. Thanks so much. I'll just say that we should be the antithesis of what disinformation is trying to make us be. So if it's aimed at making us distrustful and cynical and angry and depressed, let's be the opposite of that. I, I think that there needs to be a resolve in our own um, sort of sense of being able to tackle these large democracy problems. Um, and, I, and I choose to believe that we can and we are. Um, so I, I think that's sort of one, one key kind of perspective. I would also though really encourage everyone to lean heavily into the Facebook files, the whistleblower information, very brave individuals under great threat have come forward giving us the evidence and we need that evidence in order to properly regulate and everyone should find some role that they can contribute to on the regulation side. These are just problems taken to scale that are centered around the, the technology that we need to actually deal with the technology to get around. Um, so. Those are my ending thoughts. Thanks, Christina. Fantastic. Galit? I'm really glad Colin asked this question because it was next on Marcus's and my list. Uh, so, so thanks for asking the question, but uh, joke's on me because now I need to answer it. 
Um, I'd say that I think we need uh, to give long, hard thought about what it means to be a democracy in the digital age, because uh, things have shifted a great deal over the last 10 to 20 years. And democracies rely on informed and engaged citizenries. And that means we need to have an informed and engaged citizenry citizenry online and offline. Um, the Government of Canada talks a lot uh, these days about digital inclusion. Um, and, and what digital inclusion is about is it's, it's trying to sort of move past the notion of, you know, just connectivity. We get that half the world right now is not online, right? Um, but connectivity is not the only thing that's uh, required for, for, for citizens to engage um, online and offline. There needs to be the digital literacy elements, right? There need to be guarantees of, of, um, of conditions for, for civic participation online. Folks have to have, to have some confidence that, the, that uh, what they're seeing and reading online uh, is true. At least there's a set of shared facts out there uh, which are essential to a democracy. Uh, and then also there need to be guarantees of safety, both both for personal information, but, but also for physical safety, uh, because of course what happens online uh, doesn't stay online. So I think um, there's a real need, uh, transatlantic, to think about what it is, uh, what, what is our vision uh, for life online, uh, for, 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 for democracy is online. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Um, as we are at time, we're going to wrap up in just a second. Shelby uh, has asked that we just underline the legislation that she has shared with everyone in the chat as her recommendation going forward. Uh, with that, we'll give the last set of recommendations to Marcus before we round out. Well, I, there's not too much to add there. I mean, I think I agree with everyone uh, on all those points. Um, I would only stress that we need to defend our democracy and that means holding those that seek to undermine it to account and that means uh, making sure that the bad information that they're trying to uh, impose on us and and share with us with, that we we limit that the availability of it um, that includes using our sanctions regimes against um, you know foreign media that try to uh to promote these narratives um so we, we need to work with our allies uh to to protect our democracy that's something that we need to put a bit more focus on i think um moving forward all right thank you so much over to tom cormier thank you all thank you what a fascinating discussion uh, i want to thank shelby christina chris marcus and gullet for your uh your points your thoughts your uh, sharing your research the questions and the answers, and also to the audience for deepening the chat. Uh, and a special thanks to Gabrielle, our VP for External Affairs and her leadership in bringing uh, this virtual speaker series together. Also want to thank the US Embassy in Ottawa for their ongoing support for the series. Stay tuned for more events this fall, including our uh, marking the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence and a conversation on feminism and democracy support coming up, as well as our contribution to the upcoming Global Democracy Summit being hosted by the US administration on December 9th and 10th. So watch the space and watch your email inboxes. Thanks for your participation. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.